Hello, everyone. I want to welcome all of you to Ohio Exopolitics. I'm your host, Mark Snyder. Our guests this evening are James Horak and Crystal Clark. Hi, James. How are you this evening? Fine. And you, Mark? I'm doing great. Can you tell us a little bit about your website before we get started? Well, it's centered around the EMVs and what they perform in the solar systems throughout the universe. And different views on things that have affected the complexities of Earth and Earth's people for so long and that has developed a pattern over now the seventh lineage and how we might reverse it before it's too late because this will be the final lineage to exist on this planet and it'll be the last vestige of Earth as a planet. And our other guest this evening is Crystal Clark. Crystal, can you tell us about your website? Uh, sure. I also wanted to mention very quickly for James that his uh, website is emvsinfo.blogspot.com. Mine is drowninginabsurdity.wordpress.com and follows very similar lines in terms of the patterns of the past, of the past six cataclysms and self-destruction episodes, how we are repeating all of the same mistakes and will follow the exact same path if we don't change things. James, uh, you were mentioning the electromagnetic vehicles that you refer to as EMVs. And in previous incarnations, you have lived through previous societies here on Earth that have risen and fallen. Is that correct? Well, it's been not an incarnation. It's just been steady chronology. Uh, I have, uh, I think we, you wanted to ask me one time and uh, bring up this subject of uh, why I wouldn't be in, affected by the cataclysm here and the dissolution of Earth as a planet. And I told you that I had two manifestations. And that's true. I exist in both timelines and uh, I have, have the ability to travel anywhere I wish. So what other timeline do you live in? The original timeline. Your original timeline of Earth. Before you meddled, before people here meddled with the continuum and created a alternate timeline that you're living in now, which is in partial manifestation, as all alternative timelines are. So is there another me in this original timeline? No, so no. No, I don't know where that fantasy came from, that there are parallel universes and parallel timelines. Once there's an alternative timeline, it's caused by a deviant behavior to exact some kind of change or some kind of effect. And from that point on, everything sorts out differently. And <laughs> after 200 years, there's no duplication, there's no imitation, there's no parallel of you or anyone else. Everything's gone off on a different set of circumstances and a different chronology, a different development, and, you know, hardly anything has remained the same. The influences can extract so many variations, and that's what happens. The fact that anybody would have a double would be no more rare or no more common in an alternative timeline than it would be in one lineage in one timeline that you would have an exact double. But you're in two timelines, correct? Yeah, well, I'm not human. Could you elaborate on that for us? I'm an instrument, uh, a mechanism of the EMVs. I'm a liaison between them and ATs because they don't uh, deal with any other sentient life directly. There's a reason for that. So I don't have the accompaniments of you or other sentient life. I don't have what you call a soul. I mean, it would impair my function. So if you don't have a soul, do you see yourself as kind of a robot? Well, I grew up in uh, this manifestation and I have all the feelings and concerns and empathy and that uh, you would expect 
but I'm a manifestation that is a function of something removed. To that end, the greatest influence on my life is external or on my existence. Crystal, have you heard this before? Uh, yes, James and I are very, very dear friends. And um, um, there's there's a story I would like to tell that I think uh, it may help people understand this a little bit better. It's actually a scene from a film I watched recently, a, a show that I watched. And it was absolutely beautiful and so poignant. So if you wouldn't mind, I would like to explain it. There are only two characters in the scene. One is an odd man, very strange man, working with a known and convicted pedophile. When this pedophile was caught uh, after raping and killing a young girl, he said, well, she should have ran faster. So this pedophile and this odd man are working together. Uh, the pedophile wants to somehow redeem himself or escape through death. And the odd man agreed to help him through a plan they had to thwart an evil plot. Okay. Now, I'm going to tell you what this odd man said to the pedophile. But instead of him saying it to a pedophile, I want you to imagine that he's saying this to the New World Order. And considering that many of them are pedophiles, is very fitting. Okay. So this pedophile begins to realize that this man is very different and that he's not like him. And so he wants to know who and what this man is, and he also wants to know if they're going to make it through the day. And this is what the odd man explains. He says, the future can change. It's being written right now. One thing I do know, I've seen the stars, I've seen the universe, I have seen the human race become vast and magnificent and endless. And I wish you could see it. I wish you could see it too. And then he leans into the pedophile's ear and he says, because then you would know how small you've made your life. And this is the plight of the entire human race. And when you look at the powers that be, you know, the, the New World Order cronies, even their existence is a fraction of what's possible. But our existence is a fraction of their existence. Do you see what I'm saying? Sure. So uh, James, in many respects, reminds me of this man. He's trying to teach us what we're missing out on, how beautiful it is, how important it is, how beautiful and important the human race is, why they would be a welcomed addition to the universe, how everybody would grow and benefit from it, and that what we have accepted here as life is a travesty. We are not living, we're existing. And it really reminds me of, I don't know if they have these over in Europe, but here we have homeowners associations. And it's basically a neighborhood management scheme where the folks who live in a particular neighborhood actually pay a group of people to micromanage their lives pretty much to death. <laughs> Any, anything they do, you know, if, if the trash can is left out, if they put an air conditioner in their window, if they plant the wrong tree or the grass is too high, they get fined. And people who have ever worked for someone, uh, you know, a boss who micromanages them, they discover that the, the individual micromanaging them thinks that their children incapable, completely incapable of managing their own affairs. And this is what the New World Order is going to do to every person on this planet. They are going to micromanage us to death. They are going to decide who lives and for how long, who dies, what you wear, what you read, what you write, what you eat. It's, it's not okay. It's absolutely not okay. And this is the pattern that leads to the demise of a civilization. And we see this over and over and over again. We see it in all kinds of shows. I don't know if you guys remember the series Terra Nova, where they went back in time to Earth to, to start a new civilization. It was brand new. They could start out on the right track. The same people come in and they take over. And these are people that have an agenda. They think they're better than everyone else. They have no idea what they're doing and they expect everyone else to pay for it but them. But we all pay for it in the end. And this is really the problem. There was a, just very quickly, I would like to add, I, I'm, I'm 
99.9% sure that this was Lorraine Murray, who you may know. She's a wonderful mm -hmm. uh, radiation analyst and researcher. And years ago, she did a show with Jeff Rents, and I'd never heard her before. But she was talking about how she had done some uh, research in the field. She was an assistant to a field researcher, and I can't remember who it was apes or monkeys or orangutans, so we'll just go with monkeys. But there was a female monkey in this particular tribe who treated her offspring very badly. And because of that, the other members of the tribe shunned her. And her way of dealing with that was very similar to the way our elite, our psychopathic elite function. She would steal their pots and pans and go bang these pans together very loudly in the faces of the other members of her tribe and terrorize them. And in doing so, she became the alpha female. So you see, this is the pattern that leads to the demise of an entire civilization. You have, you have someone who behaves like that or a group of people who behave like that. And then instead of dealing with it, everybody else cowers in fear and goes along with it. Well, that's uh, that makes sense. I can see that. James, you were mentioning that you weren't human and you have no soul. Um, and you kind of told us what you are, but I'm not sure I really understand. Can you, can you elaborate on that again? My earliest memory is I'm very young and I'm laying on a concave chrome floor. I might have been crying a little bit at first, but then I feel loved. I feel like I have, you know, I don't have that separation of the, the babe from the womb sort of thing. And uh, that's the kind of relationship I have with EMVs. I have the abilities of a human. While I'm living in this manifestation, the habits and inclinations and lusts and but I also have super focus. I have access to genetic memory and to collective consciousness. And I have unified consciousness. So I need that in order to deal with crap that goes on and do what I'm supposed to do, which is to try to reach people and to tell them that there are things that are vastly beyond this reality, which they're shut into. Science stopped growing after the Civil War. A second technology came about, and even that wasn't exploited for the good, but for weaponizing everything and anything. You had the industrialists uh, financing all of this because they were so afraid of labor becoming stronger and making demands. And today, if you look at everything that has happened in the past 25 years, or even since Kennedy was killed, what you see is basically a war on labor. That's NAFTA and GATT and everything else that's gone on. There's been no enforcement of antitrust law, and every corporation has been able to run rampant, uh, been able to reorganize and then to loot the trust, the, the pension funds, trust funds, so if people have 401ks, whatever, take most of the wealth away, steal it. Sell stock, and then when they reorganize it, stock is worthless. Buy it up for pennies on the dollar or just default it. I mean, it's happened to somebody, you know. You know, when Ronald Reagan deregulated the savings and loans, that was a come on to Wall Street to begin the rape of the consumer. Not that the brokers hadn't been raping them all along by charging outrageous fees for brokering different shares or whatever, and then churning those if you were stupid enough to let them have your portfolio. Everything that has happened has happened for the benefit of the few because all of this leads to one thing. It leads to the IMF taking the lion's share of everything. It's like if you sit in a poker game and the house takes a cut of each pot, pretty soon the house has got all the money in the game. And that's the IMF. That's the game the IMF plays. I mean, how many people can actually say that if they liquidate all their debts or liquidate all their assets and cover all their debts, they'll have anything left over? <laughs> really? I mean, if you stop and think about it, it's the old adage of the poker game where the house is taking too big a cut of the potty chant. 
You know, it goes on at every level. And today, what you see is the information age blossoms, primarily because of the Internet. You see people coming around to understanding just how corrupt the system is and how all the leaders, all the elitists, fall in line with pedophilia, Satanism, some of the most debauched practices on earth because that's their club. This is what they base stupid things like bloodline and whatever on, these excesses, because if you got the power, the ultimate power is the power to have life and death over everyone. And that's what they're trying to do, restore feudalism so that you're not just a slave, you're a serf. And, of course, in order to have the happy world they want, they have to get rid of 95% of us because they feel crowded. Not that there isn't plenty. Not that if the planet is healthy and kept healthy, that we couldn't comfortably provide for even more than we have. But no, no, they're not happy. They're crowded. And this is a mentality that's been going on, and it has been enunciated in the Tavistock Institute and its publications, and the CFR and its publications, and the Trilateral Commission and its publications now for 40 years. Nonstop. And anybody that doubts what I say, all I have to do is read. You know, I'll say things that some people take as anti-Semitic. Now, I'm not anti-Jewish. I am anti-Zionist. And why am I anti-Zionist? Because I read the Talmud. And anybody with any decency in their body will read the Talmud. They'll feel exactly the way I do. But they won't do it. Oh, that couldn't be true. This is the kind of mindset that has been implanted on the public across the board. In England, they're beginning to open up just how rampant and how broadcast pedophilia is among the seats of power. And they have people coming forth now, and they always have, but now people are beginning to put it together into a larger pattern. This isn't going the way. What do they do here in this country? Because they are just as bad. They have a bill, or they have a hearing, a Judiciary Committee, an Advisory Committee before Congress that's trying to develop the basis for resolutions to change the First Amendment and take away your freedom of speech or curtail it for the benefit of the government. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it's insane. And luckily, we had one lawmaker render a beautiful speech about how disgusting this was. But the mere fact that anybody would sponsor such a bill proposal is as treasonous and outrageous and inhumane. I mean, this goes all the way back to the very basis of a free society of any kind. You know, whether you go back to Greece or whether you go to anything that ever had any roots in human decency or an egalitarian society. I mean, this is the wrench, the great wrench that's thrown into everything that is used to justify absolute tyranny over everyone. And that's what we're facing because these people are so paranoid and they have a reason and a right to be paranoid. They're being found out. Mm -hmm. They're being found out for the monsters they are. And when the American public, the English public, the European community in its entirety understand how pedophilia has been used to consolidate these secret conspiracies, these secret societies, these secret gatherings of monsters. When they begin to understand that, because it's a perfect blackmail card, it is cohesive for all of these people. They got all this on everybody. Oh, we've got video of you messing with a six-year-old. You know, they got to stay in line after that, don't they? And that's why the people at the very top, whether they're pedophiles or not, and most are, that's why they find it so useful to use this to cultivate it and to get people. I mean, it's just like drugs. It's just like a drug. And once these people get involved in this, which is the ultimate decadence, the ultimate evil, then they got them. You know, you have people that are not pedophiles, but they're so afraid. Because they know it's just like trying to go up against a network of Masons or a network of the Illuminati. If they have zoned in on you, you've got a lot of problems, a lot of trouble. 
and your family does too. That's the way the monsters operate. But this is real. This is in our face right now. Crystal, did you have any comments on what James was talking about? No, he's, uh, well, actually, <laughs> yes, I do. I mean, he, he's absolutely right. But there is one thing that I do try to stress repeatedly because it's so important. The overpopulation lie is very, very important to debunk because one of the first things that people have to understand is that they have been set up to fail and take the blame. And one of the easiest ways to prove this is through planned obsolescence, through understanding planned obsolescence. And there's a great movie that I found. It came out a few years ago, actually, uh, but I found it on YouTube a couple of weeks ago, and it's called The Light Bulb Conspiracy. And it goes through step by step all of these corporations and all of these products that were excellent, wonderful products that lasted for a very long time and how it became their business model to develop R&D programs to diminish these products. They did it with the light bulb, how long a light bulb used to last. They did it with nylons that women wear. How can we make them break faster? And so people have to understand while you have Satanists coming out and saying, which goes back to the... Uh, homeowners association mentality that it's time for new management because look you you guys can't handle this we need people that can okay that's the satanist view but what they aren't including in that is that the model that they're using to destroy everything and blame you for they have done they are the ones who have done it see the faster these garbage dumps fill up the faster your pockets fill up they can make products that last for a very long time that don't rape the environment but they don't want to so you and I are not the cause of the problem. You and I aren't chemtrailing. You and I aren't putting fluoride in the water. You and I aren't poisoning people through our mining activity and so on and so forth. And then you have the dumbing down going on at the same time. And I, I never remember who said it, but it's a very beautiful quote about how they who have put out the people's eye reproach them of their blindness. And that's what's happening. They have dumbed you down, lied to you, kept secrets, you know, stolen your history from you and now oh look you don't have what you need to perform and function properly but they made sure and there's another important thing that goes along with this in terms of uh, sustainability which is which is just an awful word at this point because it doesn't mean anything James and I were talking once and I, I try to explain to people often that manufactured lack is very real and they are making sure there won't be enough so then they can scare people into accepting the new world order to manage the planet and manage the crisis that they've manufactured it's very difficult to explain though they're making sure there won't be enough food they're making sure there won't be enough fish they're killing them off and James and I were talking one day and I said you know this is a very difficult thing to explain and I'm always looking for someone who can say what needs to be said better than I can and he did it, and he did it so beautifully. He said, well, what is overpopulation? He said, isn't it that there aren't enough resources for everyone? And I said, that's right. And he said, okay. He said, so if you go to the Amazon where the Aborigines live, and you cut down the Amazon, now it's overpopulated, isn't it? That's what they're doing. And this is not survivable long term, not even for them. These things have to stop. Well, it's reached a point where there's no future for anyone. And uh, it's like I've said, Fukushima is a tipping point. Right now, the crust is so unstable, and they've done everything they could to make their own future insecure. Perhaps they believe a bill of goods that some of their implementers have sold them, if they have, that they can run off to another planet or that they were facilities below the crust or below the earth, multi-level cities and so forth that they can depend on. No, there's not. They've got them, but they won't survive any more than what's on the surface will survive because the crusts are going to start moving. The plate tectonics are weak, and this is true all over the earth. And everywhere where they've manufactured anything at all, they have done so without advisement of how they could, in creating the cavity they did, in creating the transport system that they did, they further weakened the crust there. And you see, that's not enough. I mean, this sort of thing 
if you look at the Third Reich, the infighting was so common that that was one reason why they systemically failed, even when they had a leg up on Europe. And the same thing is true with the monsters. They have fed on other people all of their life. When they have reduced the population by 95%, are they going to stop start feeding on each other? Oh, sure, but it won't last that long. The damage from Fukushima alone is going to lead to major upheavals in the earth because the cores have gone down and four of them have hit the mantle and two more are on the way to join them. This is going to be highly disruptive, and recently a nuclear expert has come out and agreed with what I had to say about that. He didn't even know me. It was a parallel agreement, which is far more significant to me than anything else. But he's saying that there'll be fissures opening up all over the place, and there will be. Because what this does is it weakens the, the mantle contains the magma. The magma is like an armature going around a field generator, producing everything that we need to hold a complex atmosphere for complex life to survive. It stabilizes the crust movement and cushions it in the same way that the skull that has suture fissures cushions the blow to a head from having a concussion as much as possible. All of these things are structural, and the earth is highly structural living thing. And it has been disrupted. You know, this sort of thing has happened before in the past, but not to this extent. And, of course, you've been given respite. But that's ending, because the view is that there are people that be a lot more appreciative of a new sun in this system than you have shown in your lack of appreciation of the earth. I want to switch gears just a minute, and we get back to these cores hitting the mantle. I think that's a very interesting topic, but I wanted to bring up something truly absurd and kind of beyond belief, and this comes from Susan Possell's website, OccupyCorporatism.com. She says the U.S. Congress is contemplating minting a $1 trillion dollar platinum coin under the authorization of Timothy Geithner, the U.S. Secretary of the Treasury. These platinum coins would be used to pay off the $16.4 trillion debt accrued by the U.S. government. The U.S. Treasury would keep these coins in its account at the Federal Reserve Bank in Washington. Another House Representative, Greg Walden, asserts, this scheme to mint trillion-dollar platinum coins is absurd and dangerous And it would be laughable if the proponents weren't so serious about it as a solution. I'm introducing a bill to stop this in the tracks. And because Crystal's website is called Drowning in Absurdity, I'd like to see if she could comment on this absurd idea. Well, I think the first thing that's absurd about it is they're going to mint these coins to pay themselves, aren't they? That's really who we owe the money to, right? How convenient is that? (laughs) It makes no sense at all. Yeah. Yeah. How can you imagine like something the size of a quarter or a dime worth a trillion dollars? Come on, that's so (laughs) ridiculous. And that's, you know, that's a theme that um, applies across the board uh, in terms of, you know, what we consider money. It's where does the value of it come from? Uh, It's a piece of paper. It doesn't have any value. The value is the belief and beliefs are too easily manipulated, which is what social engineering is all about. This is the conversation I try to have when I can, and it's a very difficult one because so many people have bought into the cryptocurrency craze. And what people don't understand is the new world order must have a digital currency to solidify their power over every aspect of your life. They have to. And if people do a little digging, they'll find that Bitcoin was created by DARPA. Someone recently tried to argue this with me and say, well, the point of a cryptocurrency is to prove how absurd the Federal Reserve is. And I said, yes, but that's like sterilizing yourself to prove how absurd depopulation is and walking away believing you didn't just do them a favor. And if people read Eric Schmidt's book, uh, Eric Schmidt and Jared Cohen, and I always butcher the, the name of the book, it's, it's something that the coming digital 
age. He describes three new classes of people that they're going to hold to these classes through technology, through their access to technology. And oh, by the way, the government is going to cut people off that they don't like. So what are people going to do when they can't stuff their money or what they, what they consider wealth under their mattress? And it's all digital and all the New World Order has to do is push a button and it's gone. You can't get online to pay your bills. You can't get in line to get your money out. It doesn't have any value. It's virtual. It's not real. So, I mean, that has to be addressed. I, I think that's a big part of the problem. I want to get back to this whole idea of um, the mantle and um, earthquakes. Have, have you, before you do, have you figured out why platinum would be the metal of choice of these coins? No, go ahead and tell us. What do you think, Jim? The reality is platinum is more common than gold. But why would they go to platinum? And the reason would be that it takes a lot costlier refinement process to produce platinum bullion. Hmm. And that there is a cartel that controls platinum production in the world, and there is no such gold cartel. Plus, that any time that they change from a fiat currency to a new standard, like they did from gold to silver, then silver to gold, now to a fiat currency, and now to platinum, which would be their big standard that they would use if they did this. They almost always devalue, devalue the fiat currency, and of course this is in line with what we've been warned about what they intend on the 20th of this month uh, from a a speech that was given from one of the IMF biggies, a lady, who kept insisting on the numerological value of the number seven. This being the seventh month and the configurations of how and when this would be done on the 20th of the month was read by a number of people as being code for <laughs> liquidate your dollars by the 20th to the elite. Hmm. I'm starting to think an hour now, is going to be enough. Now, what's nice about this is when you blow the lid on this, when enough people know, you stop this in its tracks. Because, first of all, these monsters, everybody believes that they have all this leverage and everything. No, the big leverage that they have on us is the fear they exercise over us. Yeah. And if they lose the element of surprise, which always creates the ultimate fear when this comes as a surprise and it hits you, which they just feed on, when that's taken away from them, they <laughs> do a little recon and decide, well, no, we better not do that. We're not going to get what we want out of it. Because they poll everything they do before they do it. And they put it out there. They give you a clue. The Illuminati deck of cards. All of the things that were put out about the Olympics that were going to happen in London and all this, then it, people got wise. People were reading ahead of them, and so it didn't come off. But there was all kinds of suggestions in the halftime ceremonies. And, you know, the thing is, this is all a form of polling. It gives something to put out in the public, and then there are people, there are ad agency people that they've got to do this. They read what comes back, they poll it, they do all kinds of surveys, and they say, well, this is the effect you get. So they might not implement it. And in this case, they might not implement this. If we just talk about it, if we just say they could be doing this, so beware. Hard money in a case like that is more valuable than cash. So be advised, people. Be advised, uh, I would store up on some food. I would, you know, if you've got a way of storing some extra gasoline safely, because in the interim, when they devalue the dollar or what they call adjust it, you might not have enough money in your bank account to buy a gallon of gas. Think about that. Yeah, but they'll have trillion dollar coins. <laughs> <laughs> what good is that going to do them? You know, they can say they've got all kinds of stuff. They can go out and make these units out of Bakelite or whatever they want to do and say, this is what it's worth. But, <laughs> you know, uh, they deal with countries like China and Russia that deal in the real world. 
they have their own rules and they have their own values and uh, they don't budge on this kind of crap. It doesn't make them any difference. And as long as we have countries that have that kind of independence, this new world order isn't going to get there. The small town of Jones, Oklahoma, is the center of a new study published by researchers from Cornell University showing that recent surges on earthquake activity are correlated directly with hydraulic fracking. The 40% higher incidence in earthquakes in Oklahoma since 2009 have been found to have origination with four injection wells that have been filled with chemical-laden water used in the process of fracking. Earthquakes were recorded to have occurred a mere 22 miles from the injection wells. The towns of Jones had experienced a shocking 2,500 earthquakes of 3.0 on the Richter scale since 2008. And this phenomena can be traced to have been caused by the increase in the wastewater from injection wells due to fracking. And to put that in perspective, the people in Jones, Oklahoma, have been experiencing an earthquake about every day. So, Crystal, I wondered if you had done any research on the dangers of fracking. Yes, it's very bad, and it also recently came out that what they're using in the water is they're they're using the uh, water that they're injecting and the chemicals that they're injecting as a way to get rid of radioactive waste. So that's also part of the equation now. But the, again, this goes back to principles and patterns that if understood, these things wouldn't happen because we don't need to destroy our planet for resources that we don't need. They need those resources because that's how they maintain their power. And I, I think that's really important because these people believe that they're somehow better. They're of better stock and they're privileged and, you know, they have the right to make all these choices because they're so much more intelligent. But in reality, the only thing that these people have done to elevate themselves is push everyone else down. And this is the psychopathy that we're dealing with. They will literally destroy our own planet, their own planet, just to maintain their power. And they're not going to have any power when they're dead. There's another element to fracking, which is even more insidious. Fracking contaminates the aquifers. Yes. That's right. And here is what they've been doing. They have been buying up water rights in remote areas all over the planet. They have been stealing water from aquifers of other people. They've been doing all of this so that they could have as much of a monopoly on potable water as they could have and contaminate all the rest, which drives the value of their water up. I mean, it is madness. It's the Goldfinger scenario. I don't know if you guys have ever seen the movie Goldfinger. It's been a while. <laughs> What was Goldfinger's plot? Do you remember? I don't remember, no. He was going to buy up as much gold as he could. And then he was going to hit Fort Knox, presumably because there was so much gold there, but there wasn't. <laughs> but, you know, that wasn't necessary for the storyline. So, And then he was going to bust in there with a dirty nuke and contaminate that gold. That gold would be contaminated for 75,000 years, right? And then that would drive the value of his gold up. Uh, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, that's what they're doing to the water. And uh, another James Bond movie came out that pretty well, <laughs> pretty well backed up the takeover of water, which was called the new gold. Hmm. So, I mean, anything, any madness. And, you know, what is Monsanto doing with GMO? Monsanto is doing this with food. They're trying to make it illegal for anybody to have a source of food that comes from anything other than GMO plants. And, of course, every year you have to buy seeds from them. And, of course, these, uh, the, these are genetically modified organisms, so they are not healthy. You know, your body is going to have problems with them. And the corn that's produced, the GMO corn, mm, the carries with it. The contraceptive corn. Yeah. Carries a virus that affects humans. Hmm. I wanted to also mention that there have been over 100 earthquakes in Youngstown, Ohio, that they believe are caused 
by fracking. Let me switch gears again to this um, tremendous storm that recently hit near Fukushima. The Tokyo Electric Power uh, crews were working, preparing for the strong winds and heavy rains. It Fukushima. even created a tsunami. Did it affect Fukushima at all, or were we lucky? We don't know. I mean, they have made it a crime to speak out about anything that embarrasses the government on the issue of Fukushima. So eventually we will find out, but not yet. I imagine that it has. You can bet that it has broadcasted the contamination that's coming out of those reactors more are coming out from the residue of the spent fuel rods that have been blown around all over the place Mm -hmm. because the cores are long gone. Hmm. I wouldn't doubt that. You know, I would like to add to that, Mark. Uh, I don't know if uh, people are aware, but even the astronauts were commenting on the size of the storm. It was massive. And when I saw that, I shared it on Facebook and I said, so where's all that feel-good geoengineering can lessen the severity of storms now? (laughs) <laughs> yeah, it's creating bigger and worse ones because the geoengineering is not done to take care of any problems for the public, but to create them. It is done to make money. It is done to create more instability, geophysical, geological, and to move populations. Because what do they want to do? They want to make refugee camps, they call FEMA camps, to drive people into when things really get hard, and those people won't come out of those things alive. I want to switch gears to ISIS just for a moment here, the radical Islamists who are murdering and imposing mayhem across Iraq are generally known as ISIS, the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria, And now they want girls. ISIS has been putting up posters throughout Mosul, one of the captured Iraqi cities, telling residents to bring their unmarried daughters to the ISIS soldiers, according to a report from the Clarion Project. Citing Arabic sources, including those inside Mosul, report that the posters call for girls to participate in sex jihad. We call upon the people of this country to bring their unmarried girls so they can fulfill their duty in sex jihad for the warrior brothers in the city and anyone who does not appear will feel the full force of sharik Islamic law upon them. Crystal, I wondered if you could comment on that. Well, it's difficult to know how much of this is true because what we're really looking at most of the time is it's the same pattern the NWO uses over and over and over again. They rile us up against each other and we go kill each other while they laugh all the way to the bank. So stirring up animosity towards Muslims is a big part of it. We've got the border issue, stirring up animosity towards Mexican immigrants. Those aren't the real issues. And I thought it was interesting. A couple of weeks ago, RT put out a story about how the U.S. government said that they didn't have enough intel to decide whether or not they should start bombing Iraq. So I responded and I said, yes, I can see how it would be a very bad business decision to murder your business associates, right? Because (laughs) next time you want to hire people like that, they're not going to show up because you killed the last batch. And that's really what we're looking at. You hear stories about, well, Al-Qaeda is getting through the border. Is that right? There is no (laughs) Al-Qaeda. These are people that our governments and the New World Order pay to terrorize people, to get people in line so that they can introduce their system. That's all this is about. Well, Al-Qaeda was an invention of the CIA. We That's find right. that out. It was and, a name and, for their uh, database. Yeah, and it started out the same way ISIS did, didn't it? Yes, so, it's the same pattern. So maybe, just maybe, uh, we know that if it isn't invented by the CIA and Mossad, It certainly is being exploited by them. Yeah, never let a good crisis go to waste. Oh, yeah. 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 It's their actions in the Middle East that polarize Muslims and create this kind of mess. You know, if you want to create terrorists, you terrorize. All you have to do is look at what happened in Kiev, what happened in Donetsk. They go in 
and they find the worst leaders to support. And I'm talking about the Obama regime goes in and finds the worst leaders to support people who are the descendants of Nazis that supported the Germans that worked in Babi Yar there outside Kiev, exterminating fellow Ukrainians and fellow Russians to the tune of 40 million. Two mountains of human ash there today. You never hear about that. But that's the kind of scum that's running that government in Kiev. And they're terrorizing people. They're murdering people. They're purging. And, of course, that's fine with Obama and company, isn't it? Well, the same thing in the Middle East that they've been doing all along. They create these terrorists. And a lot of times these terrorists aren't Arab. That's right. That, that's what the database was for. And this is really just an extension. It's a database of people that it's like the actors that they have, the crisis actors, only instead of these people acting like they're killing people, they actually will kill people for money. And that's what the database is. So ISIS is no different. They found a group of people that don't care about human life and will kill for money. And that's what they're doing. Yeah, and women on top of it, right? Yeah. What I'm concerned about at the border, though, if we can get this in very quick, because I know we don't have too much time left, is we recently had uh, Zionist Feinstein come out and say, oh, you know, there's another terrorist attack going to happen. And she's sure. And I'm sure she is because she probably helped write the plan. And then we had Dick Cheney and some other social engineers come out and say, oh, it's coming. And poof, we have a border crisis. And the next thing you know, oh, members of al-Qaeda are sneaking through the border. I think they said they've caught seven of them. So this is opening the gateway psychologically. They're seeding the populace to accept terrorism on on our own soil. And this is very bothersome, along with what happened in Detroit, when I I think it was 150,000 people got their water cut off because they couldn't afford to pay the bill. And and on top of taking their children away, they also invited the U.N. to come in and fix it. Well, the U.N. is the Trojan horse of the New World Order, so that was very well played, wasn't it? Indeed, Crystal. Oh, yeah. We're we're about out of time. Crystal, uh, why don't you tell us about your website again? My website is drowninginabsurdity.wordpress.com, and James is, because he sometimes forgets, is <laughs> emvsinfo.blogspot.com. And Crystal, can you talk about your book at all? Well, the first book I wrote, I finished in 2008, but I took it off the market to revise it. I'm in the middle of that, but I do have another book out that's called When Tomorrow Comes. It's on Amazon. I'm the only author on Amazon with the name Crystal Clark, so it's easy to find if people are interested. And when are we going to get James to write a book, Crystal? I don't think that's James's style. <laughs> no, it's not my style. <laughs> you're, you're, you're not part of the cottage industry, James? No, and neither is Crystal. Just because she writes books, she's one of those rare, rare people that write for the love of writing and sharing information. She doesn't write to make money. Yeah, the blog is actually the revised version of the first book for free. Thanks, Crystal James. I hope to talk to you guys soon. Our pleasure. Thank you, Mark. Great interview. And we are out of time. I appreciate everyone listening. appreciate James and Crystal for coming, and I appreciate everyone for listening. Have a good evening. Goodbye.